nice unit testing. We had releases going, we had automated builds. Everything that you can sort of think about at SDLC. And then we had this tiny little part of the process is that if you change anything on the service, you had to write it down on a wiki. So that makes sense, right? You don't want to forget about that stuff. So our team was seen as a team to give sort of technical leadership for the rest of the other teams. And then it got, after three months, we went and started the release. And it was a failure. Is after about two hours trying to figure out what the failure was, it's because we missed a little setting and a little resource somewhere that broke the entire release process. Is and that just made me realize is um, you can have the most solid SDLC process. If you don't have your resources in that SDLC process as well, you're still going to look like a fool, which we looked like fools. So to elaborate on that is what what constitutes working software? OK, we've got our binaries. Now these binary, the binaries that that we produce, that stuff is done pretty solidly. We've got code reviews, uh, we've got uh, our unit tests, we've got uh, all the regression tests, everything around our binaries we can produce. It's reliable, it's in source control, all of those good things. We've also sorted out our data schemas. Is It's very seldom that people are updating their databases directly. If they are, they shouldn't be, but we've got that solved as well. But there's this other part that actually makes working software in its our environment. Is our servers, we don't give them the love that they should need because what does it help if I've got binaries? If I don't have all three of these things together, I don't have working software. And it's so so seldom that we actually spend time thinking about our environments. It's always, the conversation is always about it's not worth it for us to spend some time getting our environment in any sort of reliable state is because it's too quick to just go in and log in and change it. And that's problematic is that causes you to actually start your release, do all your due diligence, and then you have an absolute failure at the last critical moment. So what can we do about this? now? We all know about code as declarative imperative. So let's just do a bit of a recap about what declarative imperative is, right? So if we think about this room and the temperature in this room, if we go imperative is we can do that style, right? Is if it's if it's not hot enough, we put another log on. If it's too cold, we move a little bit away. And that is literally how we're treating our, our, our server environments and our, our resources is we, we're doing the imperative style because we tell ourselves that it's not worth it for us to spend the time to actually get the stuff into a proper state. Is I would rather quickly just log into the dev environment and add a setting. Or no, it's not going to be worth it. Is I'll, I'll just do this little thing. And that sounds very similar to the same arguments we had about hard coding things. But we've learned that that is a really bad, bad idea. So what is a declarative or a if if I want to change this room temperature, as I can tell the aircon, I want this room temperature to be at 23 degrees. I don't really care how you achieve it. Just, just do it. I just want to forget about that. What I want to argue is that with, with the technologies that we have available, is we must completely resist throwing another log in the fire because we're cold. Is it's the same thing that we did with hard coding things. It's we we have that lesson over and over again. It seems like we don't take it to heart. OK, so one way that we can solve this problem is with Azure Resource Manager. So Azure Resource Manager is a service um, that the entire Azure environment and platform depends on. When you create a new resource in Azure, it uses Azure Resource Manager under the covers. If you go add new service on Azure, it uses this behind the covers. Now, besides having just the, um, the fancy uh, add new new resource screens and stuff, is it, it also does. It's got the <coughs> so if you really want to, you can actually um, 
write some PowerShell scripts. Let's go to the Azure CLI. So the Azure CLI is also available directly on the portal. And then it's got REST clients. And all these stuff is actually exposed via SDK. That talks to the Azure Resource Manager. Um, you have your authentication and that then spits out the resource. So what, what that does is, is that you start telling the Azure Resource Manager is, um, I would like to have a single server with five IP addresses. How you make that happen, I don't really care too much about, but that's what I want from you. Is, and when implementation changes about that, is you don't care. Is if, if you think back to the actual room analogy is, I don't care how the aircon works, I just want it at 23 degrees. So it's the same thing that we can do for our, our resources. So these templates are, are super simple. Is, it's got the section called parameters. So um, you've got this template that tells you, I want this resource, right? So there's certain things that you can um, input into this template to actually create this template to, to make changes. So you can have the same template running on your dev, QA, and production. Production, obviously, is going to be a lot more resources. You're going to uh, have more expensive resources there. That's how you control it. So you will send, tell it with the parameters, like, look, this is my production environment. I want the big guns. This is my dev environment. I don't care about the big guns. But the ultimate, the end of the end of the story is that you still have the same templates. So use the same process you run on dev is the same process you run on production. Then you've got variables. So variables is um, allowing you to have specific settings inside the template to make your template simpler. Is instead of like, referencing the same thing five times, you can create a variable and then just use that variable within the template. Then you've got the resources. This is the meat and potatoes of a, of a template. The resource is defining these things that you want to create, and then you've got outputs. So another thing that you can do with templates, templates can call templates. Um, in your Azure release pipeline, you can output your, your um, outputs as well. So once a resource has created is like, let's say for instance, you create application insights. Uh, that application insights has got a um, instrumentation key. You need that instrumentation key in some other process is you can output that instrumentation key and then use it in another process. And that's that's it for the template. So they are, are quite, quite simple. Um, so let me show you. Uh, yeah. Yes, so I just want to repeat that question. So Sean is saying is that you could potentially compare dev with production by literally comparing files and doing a win merge. It's absolutely is the Absolutely. Okay. Rian, I suppose in that regard, it then falls in line with your branching strategy as well. That's it. So you have particular releases geared to either spin up or increase scale uh, ability or load on your production environment or not. Absolutely. So, so Carlos was just saying is that this, this is, I assume that's Carlos, um, is uh, that when you have this environment is because you're checking in your code because you've actually defined your environment is you can now do that in an actual um, in your branches and that's exactly what we saw in trove is while i was working on the release template is the other developers were continuing on their development i could be on my own little branch my own builds could be running directly off that file and it's a sort of contained environment and because i'm, I'm now specifying is if we go back to this guy is the power of the of the database stuff is like any data by migration that you have is your binaries without the data means nothing. But it's, it goes the same for the environment. It doesn't help you've got a perfect binaries, you've got perfect data schemas, but your server is different. Then then you don't have working software. Is working software only you only get working software when all three of these things come together and a bunch of other things as well. But so often we neglect um, how our, our software runs.
Yeah. Right, so I'm going to quickly just run this um, and I'll talk through exactly what it's doing now. It takes a couple of seconds to run. Yeah. So, so this is this is just the approach. Um, this is just for me to actually just execute it from my machine. So, um, I don't want to just show you how it looks when it starts getting created. Okay. So basically, I've created an ARM template before, and I'll I'll go through that ARM template now, so you can see how how simple it is. Is the thing that I want to mention out here is I've got a resource group over here, and then I've got you can see that there's currently there's a deployment running. So yeah, you can see like a list of deployments running and I can go look at that actual deployment as it's running. So what's happened here is on the CLI, let me just get that screen again. This is on template, right? So the screen is a little bit funky, but there's this command. So I'm using the Azure CLI. Uh, it's connecting to a resource group and then I'm just giving it a file and I'm saying is go and do this thing. So the Azure CLI then submits this template to the ARM uh, resources on Azure and it validates that. Once it's validated and started running, is you will see this process where it says it's busy starting to create it. So it won't start here if it hasn't validated. So there's there's some cool tools that you can do to validate it as well. Um, I didn't find it to be um, that critical in actually creating these ARM templates. Is generally you can you can debug them quite quite effectively. So what currently is doing, it's getting that ARM template and then it's analyzing and it's saying is like, I need all these things, right? So it's starting to create those things. So if I go back here, is we can see all our resources. So this is a fairly simple application. Um, I've got a, a little application, I've got some storage and I've got a application inside to monitor those things. Right, so, um, yeah, so uh, what we can also do is, um, I just want to see if this double one is here. Yes, okay, so, so let's look at that. It, it's, it's got a, a web app, it's got application insights, it's got a storage account, okay? So um, let's go through a typical scenario is some noob goes and it goes and deletes stuff, right? He doesn't know any better. Um, he's got permissions, so he's just deleted some stuff. Before, I would be quite nervous because what settings is in here? I don't know. It's like, I can't remember. It's now I need to go back to my wiki and hopefully everything is there. I, I don't even know what was deleted. That's all right. I'll just run my temp template again. It will now connect to the same resource and it will say it's like, okay, um, the resources hasn't changed, but I'm seeing there's some things missing. So I'll just go and create those resources again. So if we just wait for this guy, there we go. It's currently deploying. So it's already picked up that I've killed the service plan. It's recreating the service plan. It's recreating the website. Right, so what does it take to do that? Okay, so I'll just quickly set together this this thing this afternoon and I'll show you the process of, of doing this whole thing as well, but just to sort of get an idea of how template looks like. Um, my tool, my favorite tool for this is Visual Studio Code. It seems to work quite well. Um, and then I debug with a Azure CLI. So here we've got some variables coming in. So because I, I'm lazy, I don't like to type a lot and I like to have my stuff fairly static. I've said is like this thing has got a base parameter. So what I what I mean with this base parameter is like I want all the names to sort of follow a convention, right? So I'm going to start my convention off with this value around demo. So there's a couple of things here to, to just point out. It's got a default value. If I give it a default value, then I can execute this template without passing in a parameter. Um, you can have a, quite a variety of things in here. 
is you can have objects as well. So you can have a full JSON object. So if you've got a configuration object, you can pass in quite complex configuration into this. You can have things like secure strings. Um, and when you have default values is um, within the release management in the DevOps portal is you can actually get drop downs. So when you tell the ARM template, these are my possible values, is you can have some nice UI features uh, to, to guide people to be accidentally successful. Um, then on the variables is, so we've got a variable here called AI name, so AI for application insights, um, and then it's, it's normal JSON. So the only thing to, to note here is that it's got these square brackets. So the moment you have square brackets, it evaluates functions inside of it. So this fun function is a concatenation function. It's literally going and taking, concatenating things. We all know how concatenation works. And it's taking in the parameter called base and adding AI onto the back. So it's taking that value and adding AI. And now I've got a new variable that I can use. The same goes for these other ones. You can also create objects in here, settings, objects and stuff, which just makes your life easier. But what, what is useful with these ARM templates is to keep your input parameters as small as possible. So like all things is you can't just, if, if you just climb into an ARM template and start creating it, you're going to get some way, but you actually need to step back and say, like, what are my resources? What are the things I need to create? What are the naming conventions I want to use? and then start crafting it in, in a way that makes sense. Um, that way is you end up with very few input parameters, which means that there's one or two things you can tweak to actually get the output and you can use some standardization inside of it. All right, so that's the variables. Here's our resources. So um, every resource is as an as a item in this array. Um, it defines our type, so that's generally that is required. You need to tell it what API version it is. So that's the API version for this resource. And then there's some properties. So this guy is creating uh, application insights and it's got a location, it's got a kind, and it's got a couple of properties. So that's really not that hard. So um, just to show you, this is, Absolutely. So, yeah, more or less. Right, so um, this one I created, so my normal one has got the variable name AI and I've added a broken one. Um, so I just quickly want to kick off that guy. Right, so I've made a small change to, to the template. And we should see that we get a broken one now shortly. There we go. Yeah. Hold on to that question for a couple of minutes and then uh, I'll see if I can hopefully answer that. Okay. So this guy's running. So what I quickly wanted to do is just show you the right. So here we've got our broken one. Um, and if I want to then remove that, it's obviously as, as simple as just taking this out. So the reason why I wanted to show you this specifically is that there's two modes that you can deploy templates. Is you can have an incremental and a full. So incremental means is we are not going to delete things if we don't find them. So the scenario is you've got a SQL database server and you've got a website 
and somebody goes and accidentally removes a SQL Server out of your ARM template. If you release that in the full mode, it will kill your SQL Server and remove it out of your resource group. Yes. So the thing about that is I've been thinking a lot about that is, is we, the moment we hear delete, we get very nervous. But we're okay with a delete when we use it in a SQL migration script. So this is just a new thing and it's uncomfortable for me. So I just need to get used to it. I think the full is is the, the way to go. Is if on the full mode, like here, so I've removed Yes. So, and, and that is, I think, analogous to actually having a, a web server that doesn't have a UI. Is any server that's got a UI, it's going to be broken by some developer that logged in that shouldn't have logged in. Is But the moment that you say is like, okay, we are only allowing things to be released to production by using our tools, is nobody can get access to that stuff if it hasn't go through our, our, our vetted and our approved pipeline. Is that just then opens a the whole thing? It's like now suddenly is why would you need access to production? Is is you need access to production because you want to go change things? Is and you shouldn't have been doing that. You should have been using your ARM template to go from the from the beginning. Right. So. It's like in the old days, it's like people would copy DLLs and app configs to servers willy-nilly without any checks and balances. Is we do the same thing with servers. Is how often do we log on to a server and we change a setting? It's like why are you on production and changing a setting? Is it's you don't do that with your code, but why do you do it with your servers? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, guys, can can we go on here? Um, right. So here's a storage uh, node. So I've set set up uh, storage on here. So that's also fairly simple. That's just normal blob storage. Um, what generally happens is if you export the stuff from the to, from from the portal, it gives you a whole bunch of things. Half of that stuff you can take out um, and simplify it. Um, here's our server farm. So that code equates to this guy over here. It's that guy over there, and then we've got our website. So this is the part that I that I'm hoping to answer um, Vincent's question. Is the thing is is right now. So we've specified all of these things that we create. So we add that broken one. If I refresh, it should go away. There we go. So our templates has seen that there's things there that should be removed, so we can take it out. Okay. Now the thing is, is if we have application insights. Chances are very good that we'll have application insight setting within the actual app service, right? So if I open up that app service, I can go to configuration, and in here I will need some sort of setting to tell it where my application insights is, right? Um, and and this goes to your key vault. So when you set up an environment, you've got a connection string. So you've got a SQL database, you've got a connection string, but where do you store that? Okay, so. This ARM template knows about the other resources that it created. So what we've got down here, so that's our normal website, so that's fairly simple. And then we've got site config here that contains app settings, that contains that key. But instead of putting the key in, we can actually ask the ARM resources to go look at itself, to go look at a resource that it's created before and go get a value out of it. So 
SQL Server, I can go get connection strings. Key Vault, I can go get, um, you know, whatever. So um, this is where I think the real power comes in because now you can set up your 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 um, ARM template so that it can know about its different resources. Now think about this, right? So this site currently has got a connection string there of um, 3F, right? If I delete that, right, is if I do another release, what is that value going to be? Because that is a new application insights instance that I'm now going to create. So ARM templates is smart enough that when I actually rerun this guy, it will create me the application insights. And then it will go check that this app service is still correct. And it will go look at that setting and see that it's different and actually add in the right setting. So once you've defined your ARM template, you can forget about these things. You don't have to think about them again. Um, the other benefit is when you go to a different environment, it's the same thing, right? It's if, if I want to create a training environment, I just point it to another resource group and I just create it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, that was 3FF and it's 035. Um, Sean, I can't answer you very well. I've tested it with Application Insights thoroughly. So I know that it works well with Application Insights and it's key. What I also do know is that each time that I've set that up is I did have a dependency. So that guy did depend on application. Actually, that's a lie. Look, uh, I, I don't know. I've tested it with Application Insights and that seems to work quite well. I've tested it with the storage account as well, getting a storage connection. Okay. 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 Right, so some of the stuff that you can do as well is you can set up conditions. So um, every resource can have a condition um, and then if you set up that condition to be false, so we use it on um, Hintant, ach, not Hintant, um, on Halman. Um, the, the interesting thing about this, though, is that um, if the condition is false, it still runs through that part of the template because you can still depend on that resource. So, for instance, um, in this scenario, <coughs> I'm, I'm saying is create resource A, then resource B depends on resource A, um, and I'm going to talk about the depends on now, is if this condition is false and something else depends on it, it's still going to run through it. It's not going to create it, but if it is there, it will be able to retrieve your settings. So the condition is not true and false in the sense of that it's not going to execute any of the stuff. It's still going to run through it. Um, that condition just means that it won't create any resources. So uh, that, that was one of the gotchas, but these conditionals work really, really nice. Um, all the functions available in the ARM templates, um, you can also write your own user-defined functions. So if there's something funky you need to do about a date, time, and a setting or stuff, you can create your own functions. Um, I've yet to come across a scenario where I really needed to use my own function. It seems to be all the stuff is there. You can list keys and stuff.
So, so just for the guys on the call, as Sean was just uh, describing, is how you can use there's a function for copy, and you can then create multiple resources from that. Right. So dependencies is we use it every day is and it helps us to think about things it helps us to forget about the things that it depends on because once we've said is that a depends on b i don't have to think further about that is if i use that it will go and fetch the stuff automatically we use it in ms builds without realizing it we use it adding references to projects it's uh, categorizing things and saying is that i depend on that and i don't care on what it depends it just needs to sort that out for me is extremely powerful construct so right now what we've got is we've got a component, um, an application inside component, we've got a storage account, we've got a site and a server form. So if we look back at this guy, right, I've got here this depends on. So it's saying that my website depends on my service plan. Now I can't assign this ID, so this is once again, it's using it's creating a resource and it's using that ID in subsequent resource creation. And it's saying is that I depend on this guy to be created before I can do it. And you, you decorate your, your resource where that depends on. So when it references this resource in the ARM template, it's guaranteed that it would have been created. Okay, so that's this, this current template doesn't have any other depends on. And so visually it looks like this. So what will happen is um, the order of these things will at the very least this guy will be created first then the site but these other things are going to be created at the same time now that's pro possibly not ideal because we've got this little gotcha here right so we're creating a website and then we're setting this value over here right but we're saying is create my website and then set the value to something that i already have but you're not saying here that this thing should have been created before. That's application insights, right? So, so what we're saying there is create my site and set a setting in my site equal to what the value is in here. But you're not specifying that this guy should be created first. So how you would do that is creating a dependency. So that's the same template. All that I've go gone is and I said, I want to make sure that these things have the correct dependency. So that's why what I also meant with is you actually have to think a little bit about the environment that you create. You have to think about the, the flow of it. You only have to think about it once and then you can forget about it, like Sean says. Okay. So for a website to exist, if I go back here, for that guy to exist, I need to have that and I need to have storage for some reason. So if you think about if I'm accessing files or storage and I've got a connection string is I would have to have that storage before I actually have the website. So by adding in those three lines is I can get the following structure. So, so now we have an environment where it knows is before I can create my site, I need to have a server form. I need to have a storage account. I need to have application insights. So, um, that's right. So, <laughs> that sounds like a hard experience. <laughs> okay. So, that should be running. Right. Okay. So those dependencies um, then get created. So you'll see that there'll there'll be subtle changes in the way that this gets executed. Um, and the the thing is now is if we go and delete any of those resources, is we guarantee that that template will run correctly. So this is unfortunately you do need to keep your eye on this because as you saw, 
this template did release fine. So fine doesn't mean correct. <laughs> it means you got lucky. <laughs> it happened to run in the right order. Yeah, so um, one of the things that I found, if you run a release template and it breaks and you run it again and it works, you got your dependencies wrong. Just go look at your dependencies, just think a little bit about that. So this is the same as a project file, as an MS build file, is all of those things is built up with dependencies, saying is like I depend on A, and because A depends on B, C, and D, those things will be executed first before A will be executed. Absolutely, absolutely. Right, so um, the next thing is right now I've got this funny setting, and this is going to be on the fly demo, so let's hope it works. <laughs> um, like one of the things is cause, right? So let's say we need to add cause in here. Is how do I now get this? I know that there's a setting that I need to change in my environment. Um, I want to put it in an ARM template. I want to do the right thing, but I just I, I don't know what to do. Okay. One of the things that I found the easiest is yes, you can go look at the documentation. You can figure out the syntax. Um, who's got time for that, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not I'm not suggesting that you do this in your own resource group and figure out what the setting is and then put it in the ARM template. But one of the ways is you can literally go and change your setting. Um, you can break because you can kill it, right? You, you're releasing again. Okay. So all of Azure resources, you'll notice in all the blades, is they've got this export template function or thingy, right? If I go to the export template, it's now generating an export template for this entire resource. It takes a second or two. Yeah, okay. So this one, I'm specifically looking for that core setting that I added, okay? So here's my website, and you'll see here, here's a whole bunch of things that's not in my, arm, uh, in my template. The reason why I don't put it in the template, it just adds a bunch of clutter is if I can remove it and it's still created in the way that I want, why would I then put it in my ARM template? So you can, on the on the um, MSDN sites of these resources, it generally tells you is like you have to have this, you have to have that. So it's required, not required. So I go take out all my not required, run it again, see if it works, and then I've reduced my code with 30%. That's always a good day in my opinion. Right, so Here's a funny setting here. Okay, so here's my website config. Here's a funky name again. I've got a location here. It's got a dependency on. And if we scroll down, whole bunch of things. <laughs> yes, okay. So there's a little thing that we're looking for, right? So if I copy this little bit, Okay, so where we put this now doesn't matter because we're going to say it depends on, right? So I can put it at the top, doesn't matter. Um, okay, so let's climb in here and fix it up a little bit. That we need, we're telling it what it is, right? That API version we absolutely have to have. This concat parameter is what the application try to generate for me. It is wrong because I created my own little variable that holds this name in, right? So I will go and take out this guy and go variables. There we go. So that is my website. It's the website's name and it's going to concatenate it with forward slash web. 
This is the same for the resource. So I can take out that. So parameters is what I pass in. Variables is local to the template. Right, so I'm saying is create me this thing called whatever the web is called forward slash web. Uh, it depends on that guy. Number of workers, I don't care about defaults. All of these things I don't really care about. Absolutely. So go. Um, unfortunately, I have to admit to that as I often just guess and kill it and see if it still works. <laughs> Okay. Okay. And I'm dependency arm template dependency. Let's just get the right template file. Yeah. It's this guy. I just want to see if the template runs because I'm not that confident that this is going to work. <laughs> if it runs, then I'm going to delete everything, run it again, create it, and see that our cause is there. Right, so that's sort of like what I normally do to actually get those settings out. Um, and what I'll have now is that I can actually then check this stuff into source control. Um, I just want to show you while that's running is some troubleshooting tips. It does get frustrating if this thing fails. Um, right, so it's happy with my template. It's accepted it. Uh, you can go and look at these things over here to see is what the order is. So it's still busy. It's still processing these things. Um, let's go look at a one that, that did occur. So I can go look at a template that has occurred and see what it did. Uh, importantly, I can see the inputs. So be careful, don't put in your SQL passwords and stuff in here as the stuff do show up in the logs and stuff. So just be, be aware. It's fantastic to troubleshoot it. So I can see that this thing was now ran with that variable. And I can also see the output. So remember we had a section called outputs at the bottom. So over here I've got outputs and I can specify the template should be giving something out after I've run it. Same as PowerShell functions, as you can provide outputs, all of those things. Um, these are, are really useful for um, configuring your release templates or your releases to your servers. And then it can also show me the template and how it's executed. There's my parameters and I can run some CLI if I wanted to run this in the CLI or PowerShell or whatever. Um, what I use the most is the outputs to make sure is, especially if you're doing dependencies and stuff, or if you're getting out um, connection strings and all of those sort of settings of the different resources, I put in an output variable, make sure that I actually get the output that I think I'm getting. Because it's a template, because you're executing it on the ARM resources in Azure, is you can't run this locally. You have to actually give it to the service and that will provide you the output. Um, and then the other way that you can also do debugging if that fails and you still haven't gotten it right. Um, so let me delete this quickly. So it looks like that ran successfully. Okay. If I go to this guy and go delete that cause. Absolutely.
Right, so I've just added the debug switch there. Um, and if things go wrong is you'll at least get a slightly more meaningful error message here. When I say slightly, that's exactly what I mean, is you still have to sort of figure out what happened. Um, and like most things, there's small little increments seems to work best, is don't try and write this entire template from, from scratch. So the, the couple of things that I found is limit your input parameters. The less input parameters you have, um, the easier your template is to actually be useful is if you've got 10 parameters, input parameters, it starts to get clunky and then you have to map all those parameters. Limit your input parameters, uh, use those local variables. Um, and yeah, so now you've got a testable environment. You've got uh, to create another environment of this. I can just run it against another storage group and I can check this into source control and have a repeatable process. So my resources, the environment that I create is no longer dependent on a human to interact with it. And I think that's the thing that about this that makes me the most excited is that we can take that human factor out of it. It's no longer having a strategy of creating a wiki article to remember to put your settings on the production server is not a viable strategy. You end up looking like a fool once production day. So. Okay, so, so Clint just asked uh, for the guys on call, is why would you not want to use this? My point exactly. <laughs> well, Rian, uh, this is Carlos here. Yeah, um, So, Rian, can I go? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so <clears throat> you can definitely see all the massive value that ARM template can give you. Um, and just in a, a development workflow, you can see the value there, but you can definitely see the application of it uh, as far as like just creating a product and having that product be able to deploy its own environment wherever it's, it needs to be laid down. But in some of the spaces that we're working, especially if you go into an organization as a team, you're going in as a development team, uh, and especially the larger, larger organizations, you don't necessarily have control over any infrastructure or it's handled by another team and stuff in there. So um, while you have access to deploy environments and stuff like that, it's uh, depending on the size or deployment of what you're actually doing, I think it's it can definitely help in the development pipeline, but in larger teams, it's most likely going to be taken over by the infrastructure side at least by, by some other resources which you don't necessarily have control over. But um, it definitely opens up scope for being able to drop environments for uh, QA, for load testing, for being able to do those type of things. 
Right, uh, guys, I just want to share. So, so Carla just pointed out is that um, in the bigger organizations, is it's very seldom that developers have got access into the production environments, and and that is that is absolutely true. It does get tricky there. Um, I think all of these things add up into creating a organization that is more manageable and more declarative. Even though uh, the thing is, is we think about us being able to modify the ARM templates. And I think in the bigger organization is you do get a sense of that the infrastructure team will probably be responsible for these ARM templates. But that's I think that's a cool thing about this and that I definitely saw um, at one of our clients is that they had a specialist resource that had access to the production environments and that had access that helped us create these ARM templates. Um, and what that did open up was that the specialist would then create the environment. So you tell the specialist these are the things I need and they'd create the ARM template. But if there's a small little change a tweak that you needed to make is it was possible then for you to actually as a developer go in and make that change and then it can go through a, a full review cycle that will probably include some of the infrastructure guys. So um, I, th I think having these sort of checks and balances in place is like um, I don't think ARM templates should be seen as like this is a developer getting access into a production environment. This is a tool for us to say to the production people or the uh, people maintaining it, this is like this is the type of requirements that I need. This is the type of environment that I have that can then still go through a review process and that then can get approved by them in a separate stage or a separate step. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think one of the cool things about these ARM templates as well is that it it opens you up for accessing things like Key Vault. So um, I can create an ARM template that sets a SQL Server password to a value in Key Vault. So as a developer, I don't need access to that actual setting. Um, it can be a production person that might be setting up that Key Vault that applies security permissions on that. All that they need to say is that they trust the actual um, the agent that runs a template. If they do that, then they've got control over the agent, they've got control over the value. So as a developer, I'm saying is I do need a SQL Server password, but you you give the password, you manage the password. I'm never going to see that password. I'm just saying is like I want a SQL Server that can at least do five gigabytes, and please give me the password. And then it's up to the production guys to to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think what what this also has shown me is is that we often say is like, oh, this is just a proof of concept. This is just development. This is still early phases. Is I'm not going to bother with actual resources. And I think that mindset we need to think about and and change is is if if I've got enough time to spend on writing code and I'm deploying that to Azure, then I've got enough time to actually set up an ARM template and say is like this piece of code, this piece of SQL database. And this resource is what makes my application and makes something. And it's not that long. Yeah. So here's, here's an example of a team that is currently using it. And you can see all of the deployments they did. So their deployment takes about a minute and 45 seconds. 45 seconds. So. <laughs> Yeah, so now you can quickly either eliminate that or quickly say, well, that's actually changed and it's get wide right? So so the thing about this is if Zubair had a demo tomorrow to the client and I were to do this, will Zubair stress? 
<laughs> and he doesn't seem to care. <laughs> and I think that's powerful, is that we can have a repeatable environment. Anyways. So the, the thing as well is that we need to consider is this works for VMs. Um, this is sort of like, I think, the same type of technology that we get for Docker is I think Docker and this is, is achieving the same thing is it's saying is like my environment needs to look like this and I write that down in a file and I commit it in source control. And if you use Docker or if you use ARM template, whatever you use, it doesn't really matter. It's just use something. It's just in source control. Yeah. It's so simple. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, with this team, you can see they've got a, a bit more of a complex environment. Um, and if I open up their templates, it's it's uh, it's a full environment. I think last time that I checked, there was about 400 or so lines in your ARM templates. Everything. Cool. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thanks, guys.